Zoom in a little bit to, uh, to a more practical focus. Uh, we have with us a, a panel of geniuses. I like to think of them as this. Uh, Martina Österling is an agent with Albatross Agency. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Petri Kempinen is the CEO of a Nordic, Nordic Film and TV Fund. Welcome. Thank you. And Tatiana Samop Samopian. I don't know why. Some letters from your name have d disappeared here, but I know what you're called. Uh, Tatiana Samopian is, the, is a creative development producer. And I think that what we would welcome. And I think that what we would start with is to talk a little bit about what you actually do, because I'm not s sure that, that people know that. Um, let, maybe we do that, that first, and then we take a first round of just like a general spawning that you may have, uh, and then we can go into, into more detail. So Tatjana, what do you actually do? Well, nowadays, mm -hmm. I don't work that much in Sweden. I still live here, but it seems to me that uh, the work that's coming my way is from all other countries in Europe. Uh, I consult a great deal. Um, I'm often asked to judge quality of projects uh, on different levels. Uh, I tutor and teach and mentor uh, and move around on the European level more than I ever did before. And that's well, what's, give me, what's given me some sort of overview this past year, especially. On TV drama in, in particular. Only TV so drama. So what you actually yeah. do is, a lot of it is reading scripts. A lot of it is reading scripts and developing scripts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Petri, are you, uh, uh, are you involved at all in the projects that, you, that Nordic Film and Telephone is funding? What does your job entail? Entail, it's more like that we get uh, the projects that are applying for us are more or less financed. They have a majority of the funding in place, so we don't deal at all with development of the projects. So we just, I mean, read the scripts, look at the projects, say yes or no. And it's both TV and film, and recently, I mean, during the past years, much more TV than before. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this year, actually, we are in October, right? So we are quite even uh, with our support for TV drama and film this year. In, in money? In money-wise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And do you also read scripts? I do, yes. Mm -hmm. That's my main job, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. And what about you, Martina? Um, I am an agent at a pretty new agency that we started uh, just about a year ago. We celebrated a year on November 20th. Um, I have never worked as an agent before. I come from distribution uh, and my partner Erling comes from Anna Gram, where she's had various roles, which I think makes us unique as an agent. Uh, we only represent directors and screenwriters, uh, no actors, and we're going to keep it that way. And do you, I imagine immediately that that means that you're representing them towards the world. That maybe inside Sweden they wouldn't need an agent, but I suppose once you represent them you work against them with everybody. Well, we meet, uh, it depends, it's from, from client to client. Most of them we represent all over the world, but some only in Sweden, some only in Scandinavia. Um, most of our work and negotiation is in Sweden and a lot in Denmark actually, um, but some projects are absolutely international. Mm. Is the, the voice uh, comes out a little strange? Should we do something about that? Hi, yes. In the middle? Yes. Can we place it right up here? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you, what parts of your distribution background do you get to use as an agent? Well, when we um, started to talk about this new company last year, we did a bit of what you spoke about now. We tried to predict the future. Where are we going? What's going to happen? Um, Eileen coming from production and me from distribution, we felt like, ah, what's going to happen with those two elements? We're not sure. The only thing we are sure about is the fact that storytelling is always going to be needed in this industry. and eyeballs will always want to watch content in whatever shape or form. So we felt like the safest place to stand is beside the storyteller, which has also historically had a weaker position. So with our experience of actually having worked in the industry, I think we can be a resource both for our clients, but also for producers, because we understand your business and your business models and what you need. So I think we can negotiate um, much more kind of, uh, what do you say, long term. Long term. Long term, yeah. Which has been good for us. Excellent. 
Uh, we're, what we're doing often in the Nostromus conversations is literally this. I'm looking at some smart people and then I'm saying, so three to five years from now, and that I always have to do the math in my head, so we're in 18. So in 2021 to three, is that right? <laughs> I'm, it turns out I'm not good at elementary school maths. In the next three to five years, what do you think will change? And I thought that based on where you are right now, you can make some kind of observation or suggestion. Let's just do a round with that. Maybe Tatiana, let's start with you. What are you seeing right now? Well, after having read hundreds, probably up to a thousand scripts now from Europe, uh, coming from up and coming from film schools and established writers, um, you can see trends topically, most of all. And I don't know, if, if you're taking a bird's eye perspective, I tend to go on a satellite level. I just cannot keep myself thinking in terms of premises and topics uh, a lot. Uh, what, what I simply can tell you people, this ap apocalypse theme or topic is prevalent in TV show writing. And uh, it doesn't mean that most of the stuff is good, but the topic is there. But if I back a little bit from that, a, a lot, um, you asked us the question, what is it that we, uh, what we are mulling in our heads, what it is that we are thinking about? And the thing, just a, a metaphor or, or, or an image that comes back to me is the way uh, people who moved to America, who immigrated to America, uh, tended to see Europe. They called it the old country. Once upon a time, the America was a new country and Europe was the old, tired country, decadent place where culture was tired. And everybody who, was anyth who had anything creative to do, they moved to America once upon a time. And this sense of, of a tired place creatively, I get that when I read the European scripts, to be perfectly honest, and I get it even from young writers. So I'm not going to say the stuff that you want to hear. And I wish I could, but there is such a high degree of uh, in how <laughs> There's so much repetition, but not creative repetition. There's so much repetition and copying going around. So you have a sense of people who have, uh, who write based on what they've been looking at. People, people who grew up with screens, they tend to, tend to reflect back other people's stories. The other thing that comes back to me is, um, when I used to live here in, in Gothenburg, there is a place that I love. It's an old cemetery, and there is an archway that says, Tenk Puderden think about that. And it is a place where I would like to take any screenwriter and every screenwriter before they choose a project. And I will place them and say, you cannot move for five hours. Thank Poderden. Is this really what you want to write about? Is this really what you, you want to share with others? Is this really the content you want to impregnate other people's minds with? And it's not just about thinking about it, feeling, the death would be a good experience for any writer. So I think the best screenwriters are the, one, the ones who had recently had an accident, a near-death experience, cancer, or something like that, because these people are not wasting anybody's time, at least toward their own. So I'm really having a reaction to that level of, of jadedness that I, that I perceive in scripts. There is craft, there is talent, but there is a lack of life so being I'm, lived. I'm here, thank you. I'm uh, hearing you say, uh, maybe two different things. One is that they, that that the writing becomes derivative yeah. because it's based not on you're not writing about life. You're yeah. writing about you're writing the kinds of stories that you that you think that stories are supposed to be exactly. But also, is this also a problem about this shift that we're in that they're all, that they're writing for like an old media market in a way, or or is it more a creative problem? I'm I'm, I'm just seeing that uh, there are so few writers who are capable of not having a Facebook account, for example. People, writers are people who are as much immersed in technology as anybody else. They are not the people who can take themselves out, become isolated, uh, contemplate life. They don't do that anymore, and we don't do that enough. And writers should be the people with an outside perspective a, a lot of the time, and they're just, they're just too immersed and too stuffed by information to be able to, to come up with something fresh and genuine. And uh, much of my work is about first building a trust mm -hmm. with a person and then shaking them to their core to think about death in one way or another. And I'm, I'm sorry yeah. if this is too, too weird or, or morbid, but it's, it's going back to life, which, which, I, which I hope to, to achieve. Yeah, we want writers. to talk about the content, so it's good that we're at the heart of the issues. I should also say, when you guys are, are speaking, if, the, if you have like something that you desperately want to say, just wave your hand or just say it, that's yeah. also totally fine. Um, Petri, what are you mulling 
about mulling right now? What's, what's worrying you or what's exciting you? What, what's your big future thing right um, now? Perhaps I would, I would start a bit from what, what you were saying because, uh, uh, as I said, we are not involved in development, so we get the projects uh, at a very late level. And uh, there are, especially with TV dramas, there are I mean, two, two documents that are quite important. One is the storyline, or I mean the concept. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the script, <laughs> or the scripts. And uh, I do see a lot of uh, conceptualizing nowadays, which means probably it comes from the fact that there is more and more demand. I mean, TV stations and the players are commissioning more TV drama than before. And now I'm talking about the Nordic countries, of course. So probably, I mean, this has led to uh, some of the projects being very conceptual. And uh, then this is on the uh, storyline level. But then when I start reading the scripts, uh, sometimes there is something more, uh, something more in depth, sometimes not. And sometimes actually the script that I read doesn't match the storyline at all. Because, uh, because apparently, this is my guess, that, this, that the series has been pre-sold to the TV station on the basis of the storyline, on the basis of the concept. And when they start to write the scripts, uh, there are some other elements that step in. So this is my uh, observation, and I think it's because, so, because of the growing demand, and I'm hoping that it will not continue, and I'm curious uh, to see who are the players who actually really go into the development process deeply, and are they the public service broadcasters, are they the commercial stations, are they the SVODs, who are the actual commissioners who are really, I mean, focusing on getting the grip and getting the depth of the story out before they make their final decision? Or actually, what is the commitment process? I mean, how do they commit to somebody, to a company or to a writer or to a to director in some cases? And I don't know this, but I, I'm, just, I'm just sensing and seeing and reading that there are different approaches here and probably because of the increased demand. Should we, should we speculate a little bit about, about that? Who are there commissioners in the Nordic countries who, who are committed to the to the, the depth and the quality of the content on the way that we'd, that we'd wish. Yes, you know what absolutely. I think that, that um, from our perspective, there's, it's a really good time to be a screenwriter. Um, we have grown to have 40 clients in a very short time and everyone's working constantly. What we work a lot with is to encourage creativity. And so when we talk to clients about their careers, we say, why don't you take one big job and then you have a month to develop your own project and develop your own kind of dreams and, and have space in your head to, to go your own direction so that you have a bit of a slate on project. Both work for hire, but also these kind of where you go inside into your own art. Um, something that we find a bit um, like a red flag is that as a writer, you can go on for years and write and write and write and write, but never really get a credit because so much doesn't really get made. Um, it doesn't really reach a screen. So as much as there's a lot going on, there's a lot of money going into writing, and not every, everything reaches, uh, reaches green light. So Well, if it's the bad projects that don't get produced, this shouldn't be a problem. But is your feeling that that's the case? Or is it like, are the problems that are the projects that get produced the best projects? Um, I think it de depends. I think it's, you know, all the screens have, have, are different. S some um, commissioners are maybe m more known for, for buying a, or developing a lot and some do a higher, higher quality. Mm -hmm. But there is also a viewer for both, I think. Yeah, so the, this, this is key, I think. There is a viewer for, for things that is very predictable and not, yes, very, absolutely. not very original, not very uh, good, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. Tatiana. The question was you will, the, I guess, the broadcasters. Uh, yeah. Who will do that development? Who, who commits to that fire that you're looking for? Well, I wouldn't put it to broadcasters, to be perfectly honest. I'm not sure. Uh, I cannot answer that. I haven't seen any one single place that I say I would go to, to them. Uh, mm. No. It, it, uh, good stuff pops up a little bit here, a little bit there, mm. but I haven't seen uh, just one place, no. Okay. Let's return to you, Martina. What, what are you, what's your big thing right now? What are you thinking about? Well, as I said, um, as a writer looking at your career long term and really making sure you invest 
in your own creativity is something we talk about a lot. We also work a bit with packaging, which is a kind of, uh, what does that mean? No one really knows, but it really means that um, most of our writers have three to five of their own projects that they have at home in their drawer, and we really want to pick that up and make sure that they develop and work with those, with those rights. So we help our, all our clients with finding producers for those, those kind of dream projects that they have. So there's also like a matchmaking going on. Um, we have one client that is doing something a bit out of the box. Uh, Sony Jorgensen is now writing a video game. And that is something that we believe is interesting for the future. She's sitting at a video game studio for three years every day and writing a script, which is completely new. But it's also um, <coughs> such an important industry that also needs storytelling and they don't have the experience that we have in our industry. So we hope that there will be you know, more work there. Cool. How good are, I mean, and, and I'm inviting you now to be brutally honest. And if there's criticism, it's obviously not of any one of you. How good are the, the Nordic creatives, really? Like, how good is Nordic TV drama right now, internationally speaking? You asked me to be, even before, to be brutally honest, and I don't know to be anything else. I'm from <laughs> Balkans, so you have to suffer through this. Um, <laughs> I'll make a broad generaliz generalization, and there are exceptions. Please understand this. But what I see is this. Uh, when I, I read the uh, Europeans, European projects, and then the Nordics are a part of that, and, and it is that way they come to my, to my table or to my hands. Uh, <coughs> Danish are still the best writers, and it's it's absolutely true. Danish, uh, you can count on Danish drama to be uh, socially relevant. Uh, Norwegians seems to me to be able to come up with stuff that is unpredictable. You never know what they will they'll submit, and I get surprised more often than I expect by Norwegian uh, submissions. Uh, Finnish as well. Uh, there is this Finnish weird that I love, and it, it somehow is there all, all, all the time, so I love that. And then we have the Swedish TV shows. And it's Brun times 105. Mm. And I'm, I'm sorry to say they, they can't even compete with German shows now, nowadays. So these, these are the shows that come through co-production uh, selections and stuff like that that I have to judge uh, with other people from, from uh, the industry. So I think that, that still, is the, what was true five years ago, maybe, is still true when it comes mm -hmm. to quality of screenplays. And I still go to the Danish first for the quality and Norwegians for originality and, and mm -hmm. Finnish for, for a contender who nobody can predict and Swedish contender who is predictable. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's shocking. What um, <laughs> I, I agree to some extent, but I'm not sure um, if the problems are the actual creatives, possibly is the, pro the process around developing. Maybe there are too many chefs, maybe there's ego involved, maybe there are people involved in, in developing the story that should not or don't have the tools and, and the craft to do it. I don't know. Um, I think generally the level is good, I mean, to be honest. And it's good in the sense that, I mean, it's good in a conceptual level, and that is also needed, so I'm not, to I'm not at all against it. But having said that, I think also in the same way that probably the best, to me personally, but also to my colleagues, the best script that we read this year was a Danish one. It's a police series, but in the end we realized that nobody was killed, actually. One by accident, but I mean, nobody was murdered. And you will see it probably in 2020 or something. So you I'm just not gonna, totally spoiled yeah, this yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to tell which one, but it's a good one. And uh, then uh, <coughs> the Norwegians are surprising me. And I'm, there's one particular thing that I like about the Norwegians, which is that, for example, the home ground, Yemebana, I don't know if you've seen it, but you should see it because it's uh, not, not about football. It's about uh, the power structures in society. Uh, and that was written by a very young guy, and uh, also the co-writers and also the directors are of a younger generation, I mean, just fresh from film school. So there is something in Norway uh, that, I mean, takes into consideration the younger talent. And uh, then, well, Finland will be the next Norway. I mean, we know now that there are two or three, four good series in production that will be hitting the screens next year in 2020. So. Uh, 
that's a surprise because even though I'm from Finland, I haven't been thinking very highly of the Finnish TV drama <laughs> before, but now it's getting there. And uh, the Swedish, uh, there is an issue which I don't really, I mean, there seems to, it seems to be much more consensual, and I don't know who is to blame. Mm. Is it the audience or is it the commissioners? But the writers know what they are doing, so at least, I mean, they are matching somebody's expectations. And then I didn't mention Iceland, which is also, I mean, a, a good example that it's a tiny country uh, with tiny amount of, of people and still, I mean, some very, very good writing and producing. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably because they are so small, they have had to open up and that's probably helped them a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know the population of Gothenburg, but the population of Iceland is, what, like 350,000 people. So if, I mean, you can also look at that and say a, a, a population of 350,000 people can sustain international drama experts, uh, ex exports locally. Mm. And then there's no reason why, why, why a large Swedish city couldn't, any large Swedish city, for instance, couldn't do the same. So there's some kind of, there's some kind of mm. problem there. Uh, what would, I don't know, that's interesting. What, what, what is it, do you think, that is the reason? I mean, one thing that sp springs to my mind is that in any situation where something is changing, the people who have the most power or the most success in the old system will be the slowest to change. Mm. So maybe Swedish TV drama, we, were, we did it too well for a bit, so mm. now maybe we're trying to still live up to what was the correct thing to do ten years ago, but instead of thinking about yeah. five years from now. But I mean, you need the Becks and Wallanders, I mean, for sure. <laughs> How many Becks and Wallanders do we actually need? I mean, haven't we... Do, do we need them? I'm not sure. Like, do we need them? There's lots more coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we speak to producers a lot, and, and uh, we speak about what they want and what they need, and, and very few of them say to us, I want something out of the box, give me something kooky, something crazy, something new. Most of them speak about book rights and all those things that we've heard for the past few years. And, and maybe that needs to be a culture shift to something braver. Mm -hmm. um, most of those producers are big companies, very corporate structures. Mm, maybe we need more smaller, independent, leaner, uh, cooler companies. Are we mostly talking about broadcast television now? Like we're talking about the, the, the I mean, of, of course, a lot of the actual viewing is happening on their catch-up services, mm. but we're, a lot of that seems to be, I mean, thinking of the podcasters, for mm. instance. But then, I mean, we, we have the Play is a big player, no, a very big player, maybe not the most cutting edge, like mm. in, in, not the most experimental content. It seems to veer a little bit towards the sort of back direction, but... Yes. But, but certainly they have an audience for that. And then, and then to some very small degree, I suppose, HBO Nordic and Netflix. But, mm. but maybe, maybe, those, maybe those are making slightly more creative choices. I don't know. Well, the thing is that we don't know so much because HBO Nordic and Netflix, they don't talk so much. So that's the reason that they are probably developing. Or, I mean, I don't know. I have a hunch how they do, but, uh, but it's not. I mean, they are less open than the... Uh, traditional broadcasters or we are play, so that's probably one of the reasons of, of, of their success, probably, I don't know. Mm. I'm not sure, <laughs> again, uh, because I mostly deal with scripts or, or projects that haven't been done yet, mm. and they can end up anywhere, so I don't mm. really know which, which broadcaster attracts them in the end. Mm. So, to me, of course, in the light of what we were just talking about for the previous hour, I'm, I'm thinking that it seems a little bit, I mean, I, like from on, on a sort of I need to pay the rent level, it mm. makes perfect sense to, to want to, to, to get a big series commission and place it with a big broadcasting brand, uh, mm. whether it's digital or, or, or linear. But then, but it would seem that most people, like let's face it, most of us, especially if you're a young creative, you're, you're probably not going to sell a major show. Like that's pretty unlikely because you're in competition with everybody working right now. And the senior writers who, who have that skill set, who have the who know how to make a compelling story. Mm -hmm. Like the people who know what they're actually doing on the script level are likeliest to get those big shows and the new voices are much less likely to get that work. Shouldn't they be writing no, for, the, for like YouTube or for, for other kinds of distribution? But what I would say is that, which is very positive, what a lot of producers are doing when they put together writer's room, they really are giving the young writers a chance. It really is consistent in writer's rooms for us that we, we get new voices in consistently all the time because producers believe in 
and, and growing because there's a real need. Um, there's, there's a lack of writers. So I feel like uh, we have one writer that quit her job just a few months ago and she's like constantly when you say Doing quit her job, her. you mean her, her day job? Hate, her, non hate her day job in HR. Her non-writing job. Yes, yes. And she's now writing up a storm. So I feel like that's a very positive thing that producers are doing, that they are looking to kind of broaden the spectrum. So I do think you can get in the door, absolutely, and get good experience. Mm -hmm. If you are a young writer and you want to be in television, uh, and I'm going to limit myself to writer because, of course, I also see in pitches that there's a lot of people who are in all kinds of industries who, who watch a lot of television who feel, I think I should be a television screenwriter. And the, the quality of work that comes in like that way isn't mm. necessarily. But if you, if you realize that this is a job and it's a craft and you're going to have to keep writing and writing to get there, and, and you want, then that's what you want to do with your life, what should you be doing now? I can maybe talk a little bit about the work I did when I was a head of development at the production company and I read everything that came my way and I was the first and probably the last voice to say yes or no and um, people who were genuine and there is no coming around this, genuine voices will, it will get noticed. Even when they are not up to the level of the power on, on craft, you can help them. And you will, I will always go for that. I would help a person who is genuine more than a very crafty writer who has nothing to say. That person is wasting my time, my lifetime, I, I feel that. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite, quite, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having this sense we can die any moment. And I've, for all sorts of reasons, I'm seeking that, that presence in my own life. So I'm, I'm also drawn to people who have them, have that presence. And when it comes to writers, these writers are simply there. They are not... They're not uh, for hire all the time. So young people, absolutely, if they have something genuine to come with and they have a, cert a person who, who is open to that, they will get a chance. Of course, if the other, a person on the other side is not open to that, then they have to come up with other strategies. But I would always, in that position when I was a story editor at SVT as well, genuine voices all the time. What, what do you say, Petri? Well, where, where are we going with this? As I said, I was it's six years since I've been involved in development, but this is what you are saying is confirming because I that that's how it was back then, and if it's still like that, it, that's good, I think. But I don't really know. I mean, my, my experience of development is not uh -huh. contemporary, really. But you have you probably have a, an an idea of what's going to happen in the marketplace yeah. uh, over the next, let's say, five years or or, or, or perhaps even longer. Is TV drama, is traditional, quote-unquote, traditional TV drama going to continue very strongly, or are we going to see more hybrid forms? For what is traditional TV drama by your standards? Well, I, I don't know. What is traditional TV drama by your standards? Um, I, I think, I think uh, because most of the viewing is now, especially with the younger generations, is, is binge-watching and on, online. I think that will grow, and also the older generations will learn to do that. So this is, I mean... the. The issue that you took up with Big Little Lies, for example, is it going to be a feature film like on TV, like two or three episodes per every evening? Or what is the viewing habit of the people? That will probably be like this. So I would say that the more challenging uh, formats will have a chance. And I'm still talking about TV because that's the screen where you watch yeah. it. Mm. But I mean, so it's. So living room content. Whatever, yeah. yeah. Yeah, something living room, uh, social or antisocial living room content. That will, that will be there. And also the more, more I mean, streamlined uh, conceptual shows will be there. But uh, what was the question exactly? What kind of TV drama do yeah, you... Uh, what kind of TV drama do you think yeah. people will make and watch? Because, of course, if you're only starting out, again, like, that's what you should be writing towards, mm. I think, probably. The, the, the kinds of... The, the, the landscape of five years from now, not the landscape of well, five I think, years Well, I think I think as a young writer, you should be very brave of what you want to do, and you should stick to that in a way. I was, I've been so happy during the past two years, because we do this event called Nordic Talents every year, where we invite uh, graduation students from the film schools to pitch their next project, their first professional project. I've seen the quality and the intention go up like this. Uh, people are not conceptual. They know what to do, what to do a concept, but I mean, they are much more, I mean, related to their personal feelings and I mean, what, what they have experienced in their life. They start from there, and I think that's a good start for a young writer. I mean, to start from what you know, and then develop from there. So I'm, 
I'm actually quite positive about, about them. And since I see the examples, for example, in Norway, I also know in Finland it's like that the younger writers get a chance with the broadcaster because there are people who take care of them. So I think this is this is a key. And I think, I mean, aggregators or me mediators like you are also needed, especially in the bigger markets, uh, to, I mean, help people connect to the right people. Martina, what's your analysis? What, what do you think the landscape, a TV drama landscape, will look like in five, or five years? Um, <clears throat> I think there will be keep on as we are, developing a lot. I think there will be new players like Amazon, which means that uh, there will be a slight, slight panic and ruffle around that, but it's a strong player that we just can't brace ourselves for. Um, what I also am hearing is there is actually a need for bigger, broader movies. And there's actually people saying, why don't your talent come to us with their ideas for movies? The problem is my talent don't have any ideas for movies anymore because they've been running for the for the TV. Mm. Um, so what I am communicating to my writers is, if do you have any ideas for movies? There is now a moment in time where companies need to, or and are creating slates of bigger Scandinavian Swedish movies, um, and there is a gap there. So mm. it's not completely dead, I think. Interesting. Good. Yeah, Tatiana, what do you think in the next, like five years from now, what is the TV drama landscape? Well, what's in development right now is a lot of stories about uh, climate change. I can tell you that. We'll be seeing that a lot. And a lot of stories about meaninglessness in one form or another, both from the young people and the older people. The, the, the stories that tackle this theme of being overstuffed with information, but hungry for meaning and they take different shapes. And I think it's, it's the, the feeling that you get from, from Europe in general, culturally. So it's no, no wonder. What I'm lacking in all that are stories with also, that, that presents a way out of this. So people are very good at describe, describing a, a, a dead end situation. And they're like, okay, and? So writers who are also visionaries, writers who are capable of getting outside of their own cultural context to find answers to the problems of their own culture. So this is a problem of, of Western civilization and you cannot solve it with the mind frame from Western civilization only. So people who are capable of getting outside of that, I think are amazing writers potentially. So, and it could, I mean, it could also be some other kind of research. So what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that, that if things are good, when writers are good, they are able to look to themselves, to their own lives and say, okay, this is, this is a, an existential question in my life, for instance. I feel that everything is slightly meaningless or I'm afraid of the end of the world. But then they should be able to take the a following step, which is r stepping outside of their own emotions mm -hmm. and look, doing the research and saying, okay, where is the hope? Or like, what is the science here? Or like, what could the utopian society be? Or what is, what, how would another culture solve this problem? Something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and put that in so that, so that you can take the viewer on a journey. So, because just recognizing it maybe isn't enough. You also have exactly. to change something. Exactly. Yeah to be a powerful storyteller. Okay, are we training our writers correctly for this, for this kind of content? Are we commissioning right for this kinds of content? Are we funding it right? You, have a, you get away with the, on the funding question now since you come in so late, like it's not your fault if it's not true. But what, what do we need to be, to be able to, to grow that kind of storytelling? I think we need to let <coughs> writers have creative freedom and create safe spaces for them to write together. I think. I am not a writer, but I can imagine going into a writer's room where you don't know anyone um, uh, and you are forced to or uh, expected to perform right away. It's a slightly uncomfortable situation. So to kind of work, work with writer, writer's rooms, how do we create spaces where our talent can be creative and blossom and do that in, in, in a nice way? Uh, it's such a unique situation of being dropped in a room, writing a TV show, show not completely knowing each other and be expected to perform. Um, no wonder it doesn't always run smoothly. And how do we, as people around that, how do we help them along the way? Um, 
I don't know, it's a question more than I don't have an answer, mm -hmm. but I think, I think we can do a lot in the writer's room to, to promote creativity. I guess one answer is that, that also that, that people who are starting out writing maybe not only write on their own, like maybe one, step, one way of taking that step is to, is to sit down and make your own writer's room in a way, yeah. because this is a very new format in Sweden. We haven't had writer's rooms or in the Nordic countries in general on TV shows in that way. We had collaborations, mm -hmm. but now people are trying to work with, based on this American model, so everybody's learning how to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah, we still have this uh, argument about what we should call it. I mean, some people in the Nordic countries don't like the concept of writer's room because it's an American concept. But I mean, and there is, I mean, we use a lot of time, uh, abuse time actually, to talk about it. But I think it would be interesting to, to learn how the different groups of people who are writing a series together, how they work actually. Are they sitting in the same room? Do they work on Skype? How often do they meet? I mean, what is the process? Mm -hmm. This would be very helpful, I mean, for, for all of us to understand and also for the newcomers to understand mm -hmm. that, what are the different ways of co-working, because mm -hmm. I think co-working is quite good. Uh, I don't believe that you can write a 10 episode series um, by yourself, even if you are Adam Prise. I, I don't think it will be a good one. But, but the, and then, I mean, the other thing is really what you were saying is that the safe exposure, exposing yourself in a safe environment, exposing your ideas and thoughts and visions, mm -hmm. that would be very helpful. I mean, you don't, there's writing skills you can learn, but you can't, you can't learn, I mean, the other, mm -hmm. other elements that you were mentioning. Even very experienced writers have imposter syndrome. <coughs> You just cannot fight it. It happens. So I think we can learn a lot from the tech world when it comes to agile working uh, and, and making that a, a smoother process. And testing. And that's actually the most terrifying thing because that goes again back to what I was talking about before. You have to know who the audience is. And I think I believe that every good piece of storytelling has an audience, but I don't always think that, the, or my experience is that the creatives don't always know who that is. So you have to, uh, you have to dare to speak to to humans who are not writers mm. on in the it's process. It's huge. I, I mean, I, I feel that writers shouldn't only write and shouldn't write as much as they do. So there should be gaps in between projects when you go out and live. Um, young writers especially, I find it quite kind of, cons it concerns me that they want to write when they're 21. Yeah. <laughs> a little go live a little, uh, travel, uh, get your heart broken five times and maybe then you can write about love. Um, there is something about, there, uh, I once uh, listened to Ingolf, Ingolf Gabel, uh, the old DR uh, head of drama, who said that he had, uh, it was when DR had a lot of money to, to invest in the best of writers, so they gave them salary even when they weren't writing. So they had a lot of space to do the research and go out and investigate things that they wanted to write about. And there is something about that type of funding that I think could be useful for writers who have already proven themselves at some level. Uh, to do the proper research, and proper research is not Wikipedia, proper research is not three or four books, proper research is not talking to five people, proper research is immersing yourself for a year in an environment that is foreign to you. So if you want to write about teenagers, go ahead and be with them in some context, thoroughly, not just talk to your own children. If you want to write about people from the uh, uh, um, suburbs, Seriously, if you only know two people, you're not qualified to write it. So and also, if you're not from there, like, yeah. Don't maybe, even bother. Maybe, don't, you should, don't yeah, maybe you should write about something you actually know. I mean, you can do it. Like, yeah. I, I used uh, often in, in my lectures, I talk about David Simon and David Milch, people who have offered their, uh, given their own lives and their own time and their own hearts in order to write The Wire. You have to research what David Simon did with his life to make him capable of writing The Wire. What does it mean to be embedded? among hmm. addicts? What does it mean to be embedded among, among uh, police officers and get your heart broken when your friends get killed? Then you're equipped to write about that. So you but cannot those kind of resources don't exist when you make a TV show. But he was, it writing, he was writing a book for us. So but then it's like a passion project. It's something else. No, no, no. Yeah, but when the, yeah, but the said, wire. Like, how, is that not, how was it not worth it if the outcome is Absolutely. the wire? Absolutely. Of course, we have to and be And I think the then. best <laughs> ones, the best ones, should really consider. I said, thank you, And if you are so gifted and you have given so many years to developing that talent, don't you want to leave at least one show after you? That's the why. That's your the wire. Just one mm -hmm. would make everything else worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So, one. Sorry. Experiences mm. into the same room, yeah. Have to actually spend 10 years 
I'm just saying, repeating this for the, for the, for the mm. recording, that, that the reason that we have writer's rooms, one of the reasons is that you can do it more efficiently. You don't have to spend 10 years because mm. you can combine many people's experiences. But writers are also professionals. They don't only write their own character, their own life. They, mm. also, they have, I mean, it's, it's their craft. They well, can the, write uh, different stories, different people, they, different journeys. Many people can write what they think other people are like, and they mm. are good at formulating that in a, in a way that catches attention. That's a whole different thing to being a spokesperson for somebody who lacks a voice. So if you want to write about addicts, you can write about what you, who, you, what you think about addicts, mm. and you can write from an experience of, of, of having befriended addicts. Falling in love with addicts. Or being an addict. Being an I addict. Or no, I don't recommend that as a research. But you strategy. know what I mean? There is a difference between <coughs> writing from your head and writing from your heart. Yeah. Of people who write from their heart have exposed themselves, have become vulnerable in the process of researching mm -hmm. the characters, for mm. example. Final question, uh, final round of questions. Okay, I have now done the math on a piece of paper to be 100% sure. In 2023, <laughs> five years from now, what will have changed? And now we can, if you need to expand it from just the TV drama in, 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 this, in the screen industries, what do you think will have changed in 2023? Any kind of thing, big or small? Who wants to begin? Martina, you look like you have something. My, my I mean, given my, what I do, uh, I obviously want to uh, increase the status and position of the writer and um, the writer's rights within uh, the creative rights of, of, of making a show and making a movie. Uh, being a part of the whole process from from start to finish, and that does not happen uh, now. But also giving them a lot of confidence. A lot of writers don't know their own worth, and a big part of my job is to boost them and say, "World is your oyster. Without you, there is nothing." <laughs> uh, the shorter format, which is the feature film in this case, will hit back, uh, and uh, it will affect the. Uh, TV dramas as well, so there will be a renaissance of telling a story. I mean, steps further in the storytelling and in the visual style. And the amount of TV drama will be more or less, maybe a bit more than it's now. Uh, the amount of produced films uh, will likely be stable or go a bit down, but not too much because, as you were explaining earlier, there will be still some money available for, for every filmmaker to make their film and they will maybe be distributed, maybe not. Mm. I, I forgot yeah. something. Add. Um, I believe and I, my hope is that music will be the bigger part of the experience of watching TV and, 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 uh, and movies. The soundtrack will be a part of the experience that also makes you um, go back to a show or, or a film, kind of like you know, with, with the bodyguard or and then those mm. kind of classics, uh, I believe that will play a bigger part in the future. That's it. Well, I want to mention an elephant in the room in the form of the fact that uh, people who have been passionate about, about TV shows, and I'm absolutely one of the fanatics I used to be, uh, are watching less and less. And it's not just because we don't have time, it's something we, we are just not seeing what we need to be seeing um, anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is something that ex experts, people who really love this, we are all telling this to each other, but you know, we are not communicating that the viewership is really not there anymore. So I hope that the, the key players will realize that people are watching less and maybe provide a more quality uh, content for us to see again. I have to end with a yes or no question, at least literally just yes or no. In 2023, will a Nordic writer or a Nordic writers team have created a TV show that becomes a global phenomenon? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, I, I think so. It's possible. Very good. Please give a big hand to Martina Esteling, Patrick Kempinen, and Tatiana Sarafian.